Welcome to the latest Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app on Apple, Apple Podcasts, and on Android. We recommend Five Reasons YouTube channel or Spotify. Also, check out our new Discord server. It's still kind of new. Uh, $2.99 per month. Communicate with Heat fans and with us. Also, get the latest draft and free agent news first. We put things first there these days, everybody. Uh, link is right here in the description of the podcast feed. And on the YouTube channel, again, this is Off the Floor, our Discord server. Check it out for $2.99 per month. Also, check out the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. A lot of rain last week, right? Uh, particularly uh, in my way, in Broward County East. You might want to reach out to our friends over at Water Cleanup. If you think you got a leak, they can do the leak detection for you, the damage assessment. They'll do everything. Of course, uh, we recommend the preventative coverage. Check them out at WCUFL.com. That's WCUFL.com. Water Cleanup of Florida. More than 75-star reviews on Google. They service all the way from Boca on down. Actually, they service north of that as well, but we know a lot of our, our listeners are south, so we do want to tell you they will service Dade and Broward Counties. Check them out at Water Cleanup, Water Cleanup of Florida on Twitter and WCUFL.com. If you've got the schmutz, they got the guts. And now, today's episode. Down to this gang. Yay. Uh, five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck and say, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop with one hand. And Pat, we trust. It's power, have the guts. We're here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Five on the Floor. We are in draft season. We'll be getting you more draft coverage as we go forward here. I can tell you that Alex and Brady will likely be at the arena for the draft. I will actually likely be in New York for the draft. Greg will be anchoring a lot of our coverage. You can also, of course, check it out on the Discord server, as I mentioned and on playback.tv backslash 5RSN. So we're looking forward to this draft, the Miami Heat pick 15th. We're also looking back at past drafts and what happened during those drafts and whether or not they took the right player and how history might have been different if they had taken someone else. So essentially what we we're doing is we've thrown a bunch of these years into a hat, and since we do have a couple of different platforms here, uh, five on the floor. We drafted first. I'll just say that we drafted first because um, I made that rule. Uh, but Eternal, Matt, those guys, they're going to get to do a lot of cool stuff on playback. And we'll join them for some of that as well, where they're going to take some of the other years. So we're going to start here with the year that changed the Miami Heat franchise, which was 2003. And we're going to look back at what led up to this. Now, we did consider doing some drafts prior to this. And we might by the end of this time, depends how many days of episodes we need to fill. Um, so we could have done 2002 with the Karan Butler draft. And of course there were the pre Riley drafts, cycle, a uh, Harold minor Glenn rice, which I know is one Greg probably would have wanted to do Willie Burton, uh, Sherman Douglas, you know, there's, there was, there was Harold you know, minor, stuff. Harold minor, but we know that like we'd be boring Alex and Brady to death. Um, so we oh, really want to go that direction. Yeah, we didn't want to go back quite that far. And uh, so, so you know, we figured at least we'd start in this millennium. And we're starting with Dwayne Wade. Um, 2003, fifth pick overall. I want to take this back a little bit before we get to the actual selection of Dwayne. And I, the fact that this is 21 years ago is just making me really ill. Um, but what people have to remember is that the Heat were in a two-year funk, okay, uh, the Heat's valleys haven't lasted very long under Pat Riley, but they had a, they had some, okay? Uh, and in this particular one, it was like, okay, current, trying to create a new build. So they had the Zoe build, the Zoe and Timmy build, which was successful except for the playoff results, really. Like, regular season, it was really good. Um, one year, they beat the Knicks. They advanced to lose to Jordan in the conference finals. The other three years, they lost to the Knicks in heartbreaking fashion in the final game. Um, and then, of course, they pivoted around Zoe and brought in some other players, Eddie Jones, Brian Grant, Anthony Mason. But then Zoe got sick. And so that didn't pan out the way they wanted. And so essentially, they had this one really weird year, which was 2001-2002, where it was like every like 
seventh man on another team ended up on the Heat, right? Like, Greg, let, let's go through the list. Uh, you do one and I'll do one, okay? Here, I'll do one first. Travis Best. Kendall Gill. Cedric Sabalos. Malik Allen. No, I was he that year? I think he came in later. Oh, did he? Oh, okay. He wasn't one I'm of those not... journeymen. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another. Jimmy Jackson, who actually hit a bunch of big shots. Like, if you were Rod to ask Strickland. Me, did, Rod Strickland. Did Rod Strickland, Kendall Gill, or Jimmy Jackson ever play for the Heat? The majority of people would say no, right? Like, yep. that year didn't happen. I, although Jimmy Jackson was really good for them. Gill was okay. Uh, best wasn't I bad. Some, uh, some, was it 06, 07, or 07, 08? Like, when they had Penny Hardaway? I might have been 07, 08. Yeah, reminds me, reminds me of that. that was another another weird year. Most, the most random guys to ever show up on the Heat. Um, uh, Mo Hark was Chris so Quinn. Crazy. I think he came in as a part of that too. Yeah, no, no, it's true. Well, look, this two thousand one, two thousand two team again. It just like they were just shuffling in parts. Um, you know, I I just remember Cedric Sabalos eating a lot of Cheetos before games. That's my memory of that that season. Uh, two, love heat Cheetos. culture, baby. That's right. Two, yeah, that was not a heat culture season. Uh, 2010, excuse me, 2010. 2002, though, they drafted 10th. And again, we're not going to do that draft today, but it was really the first big break that the Heat had caught in a draft in a while, which was Karan Butler, who was supposed to go top five or six, slipped to 10. Now, there's another draft we're going to do, 2015, where a player slipped to 10, and it actually kind of effed up their sort of plan uh which you know justice not necessarily better um but that was 2015 but in 2002 like the Quran Butler, the absolute sl slam dunk he was he was great yes he was great in college uh at, at UConn and of course he's still with the organization now but that team was off <laughs> Eddie Jones was kind of like the carryover star who wasn't supposed to be um, he was being paid like one, but really they didn't expect him to have to be the lead guy. And so you had Eddie, you had Cedric Sabalos. I think that year was the, the year Malik Allen came in, right? Like, I feel like that was a Malik Allen. He year. was on the team the year before, but he started the year that you're referencing. And they also had Anthony Carter and Travis Best as their point guards. I remember heading into the draft that we're about to talk about. It was all about, are you going to upgrade at the four or upgrade at the one? Um, those were like the two mm -hmm. key points for Heat fans, and it was just interesting to see that lead up to the draft. Yeah, no doubt. And so let's go to the lead up to the draft, which actually goes back further, which I will never forget. Um, I've worked around Tim Donovan, uh, VP of Media Relations, I believe is the official title now, or maybe it's a bigger title than that. Tim, of course, uh, for those who don't know, came down with Pat Riley from the Knicks. Uh, so and Tim's been here very, 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 I think he doesn't want me to remind him, but he's been here a very long time. It is unusual to have a PR director. And then not only that, but the number two with the Heat, Rob Wilson, has been here almost as long. He came in from UM a few years later. So Tim, I can remember uh, making a phone call to me. He was not happy about a column that I wrote um, for the Sun Sentinel because I wrote that the Heat should lose their last game of the 2002-2003 season uh, to get a better chance to move up to try to get Chris Bosh. And if, if for people who don't um, who don't remember the circumstances of this, th it was LeBron, right? And there was this kind of, you know, like folklore story about Darko Milicic. And then there was additionally Carmelo, who had just come off, you know, a national championship in his one season in college. And then it got a little murky, but it was the feeling was that Bosch was probably the fourth best player. Um, of course, it, and as we talk about this draft, you know, what happened between number two and number three? Uh, essentially, what I was told was that Larry Brown did not want Carmelo uh, with Detroit. Um, I was actually told that by Rip Hamilton, so I, that's a pretty good source, um, I would think. And so, aggregated. essentially, yeah, I, well, aggregated. So, essentially, uh, Car they took Milicic, um, and he was a bust. I mean, I I shouldn't say, but there's a current Heat player who played with Darko. Darko Dark was getting... And Darko was, yeah, well, Jerry's still out. Darko was getting paid more than this player in Minnesota. This player was the best player on the Wolves. You could probably figure out who that player was. It was not Jimmy. Uh, and and it, the idea that Darko would be paid more than Kevin Love at any point is sort of outrageous. But anyway, he was the number two pick of the draft. And 
uh, and Carmelo was third. And of course, if Detroit took Carmelo, you never know what would have happened. They ended up winning a championship going forward um, with Tayshaun Prince as their three. But if they'd gotten Carmelo, would he have been the sixth man to start? You never know. Uh, Because Darko didn't contribute to that team. So anyway, I'll let you guys jump in here, but I just want to close the loop on what happened the last day of the regular season. So they were sh- they should have lost to Toronto. And it was admitted to me later that, yes, we should have lost to Toronto, but we suck at that. Um, and so they won. And so that put the Heat in the number five spot uh, in the draft. But if you go back to the projections of that draft, Dwayne Wade was not supposed to go five. He was supposed to go nine to the Bulls. Okay. That was the feeling that he would end up in Chicago. Now, you guys remember who Chicago drafted? Kirk Heinrich. There you go. Who ended up being a pain in the ass for Dwayne his entire career, basically. Um, and, and actually, Kirk Heinrich is, is the answer to another great trivia question because he was the impetus for the whole shut up and manage your own team thing because it was Kirk Heinrich's dirty foul uh, that ended the Heat's 27 game winning streak in Chicago that led LeBron to whine about it after the game which led Danny Ainge to whine about it on WEI, which led LeBron to tell us in New Orleans that he was annoyed at Danny Ainge, which led Pat Riley to try to save the long-term future of LeBron with the Heat, which didn't work, by basically telling Danny Ainge to shut the fuck up and manage his own team. And, of course, you know we that's, that's the legend of all that stuff. So, anyway, they were supposed to lose that game to Toronto. They didn't, okay? They were Thank God. Them. Right. Do you guys remember who they were projected to take at five? Uh, I know a couple guys. Came um, in. Go ahead. Ford. One, uh, it, it was named uh, Machik Lampe, was a big mock draft guy. Like, if you go back there, there were a lot of people that had him as the Malik Allen replacement as a four for Miami uh, at the five pick, but also. There was a lot of people that had Chris Kamen and then the two guards, TJ Ford and Kirk Heinrich. Yeah. I was on the Kirk Heinrich bandwagon. I thought he'd slide next to Eddie Jones. You'd have a starter. That's where I was heading. See, I wasn't thinking big enough because obviously they got Dwayne and that changed everything. But um, those were the names to me that as I you know, kind of think back to that draft, th- those were the ones that I had keened in on the most. And I, I like TJ Ford a lot, but I just didn't think that they'd take that small of a guard. Uh, so yeah. really Heinrich was who I was expecting. I was surprised that it was Dwayne Wade. But then the minute I saw him play, I, I knew that it, it would be a fit. And we can talk about that later. But uh, those were the names that were floating around that I remember. Yeah, I, I, Heinrich and Ford were the two that I heard the most. I, I You know, it's funny. Because uh, Pat will dispute, uh, as you guys know, uh, he will dispute that he was going to take Chris Kamen. In fact, he's brought that up at a couple of press conferences since because he knows that that's a narrative. Um, <laughs> uh, some will say he was going to take Chris Kamen. Uh, of course, he's framed it as we discussed a lot of guys. And I can't remember exactly what he said. So I apologize if I'm, I'm misstating uh, his viewpoint on this. Uh, but, you know, again, the the legend of this came out that essentially Pat was on the treadmill uh, watching Kentucky in the Elite Eight against Dwayne. And Dwayne had like that was his breakout. I remember watching that and being like, well, that, that kid's an NBA like that. I mean, he looks like an NBA star type player. He, he had an NBA body um, and all of that. Uh, but. There was a there was some buzz around Cayman, but I'm with you, Greg. I, it was more Ford and Heinrich, I think, and and it's actually kind of flipped because Heinrich ended up going nine. So I, I just want to get to. Uh, it's interesting to look back at this. So Alex, I'll I'll quiz you on some of this, okay? Um, if I was to say to you, uh, okay, here here we go. Here, we, so basically. If, uh, I know you don't think this is a perfect statistic, but we'll, uh, I'll give it to you because it's over a large enough sample size. VORP, which is this basketball reference stat that they use, which I don't know. Box score estimated the points per 100 team possessions that a player contributed above a replacement for... level player translated to average team and prorated to an 82-game season. Okay, multiply by 2.70 to convert to wins over replacement. All right. LeBron Value James... over replacement player. Correct. Thank you. Value over replacement player. LeBron James was VORP is 151.9. I could just... It's outrageous. Um... Who 
is second in that draft. Alex? Dwayne? Yes. And it wasn't particularly close, actually. Oh. Um, so Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne went five, and he was at 62.8. Bosh, uh, excuse me, Carmelo was at 36.7. So this is over the span of the play- careers. Yeah. Yes. While while playing three more years than Dwayne. Wow. Bosch was at 31.1, and of course his career was cut short. David West was fifth. Um, and he was drafted 18th at the time by I guess, New Orleans, right? Uh, and Kyle Corver was sixth out of Creighton, the 51, the 51st I mean, pick in that draft. Mm-hmm. That kind of tracks. Like, I mean, David West was really good for New Orleans at a certain point there, and then mm-hmm. he was like a just a big part of those Pacers teams. Corver was a part of some good teams too, and was one of the best shooters. Like that kind of tracks. But the fact that it's a big difference between him and Melo, I think, is what kind of stands out there. Yeah. Well, and it's not particularly surprising to me, except for the fact that Dwayne played eight thousand fewer minutes. Exactly. Um, yeah, and <laughs> the other thing is. Uh, if you go down this list a little bit, it's then Boris Diaw, who's picked 21st, Heinrich, Matt Bonner. Finally, Jack another Howard. lottery pick. Heinrich got in there. You see how many non-lottery picks you're saying right now? Exactly. And then Matt Bonner, Josh 45th, well, Josh Howard, who was picked 29th. I didn't have the best moments against the Heat in the finals. Uh, Mo, Mo Williams, Leandro Barbosa, Luke Rittenauer, and then you get to Carlos Delfino and our own James Jones, who actually was 15th. That's uh, a good draft. Even though man. he's picked, picked 49th. Yes, and then TJ Ford. And TJ Ford's a little unfair. He played eight seasons. Uh, he had back problems, and, and so that's why he was at Elite. Uh, by the way, just for the record, Kendrick Perkins uh, ended up 24th in VORP uh, of this draft. He was picked 27th. Oh, he did okay. win a championship that we, ne- we never failed to hear the end of, honestly. Um, so when we come back for break, I want to go to you guys on this, uh, kind of when you knew, kind of when you knew that not only was this the right pick, but this was like a franchise changing player. Before we get to that though, tell you a little bit about our friends over at Jersey's 305. Hey, it's Ethan Skolnick for the Five Reasons Sports Network. We've got a great new sponsor that fits with us perfectly. It's called jerseys305.com. That's jerseys305.com. This is your home for dead stock and vintage jerseys from the Heat, Panthers, Dolphins, Marlins, and the other local teams. Their mission was born from a passion for wearing jerseys of the old styles and the past players. Jerseys 305 aims to make every fan stand out from the crowd with unique pieces that you don't commonly see anymore. Maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, but not today. And Jerseys 305 was created by the fans, for the fans. They're diehards just like you. In fact, they're probably listening to this episode right now so check them out jerseys 305 their partnership with five reason sports celebrating with a 10 percent discount on the next purchase using the code five at checkout unlock your exclusive savings on the entire vintage collection all right welcome back to five on the floor um when did you know greg it was early it was like um, preseason. You could just tell that there was um, – I remember I got a text from somebody that said he's already the best player on that team, and I didn't believe it because I thought it was Lamar Odom, the prized free agent uh, acquisition. And uh, it was pretty apparent very early that it was Dwayne. Um, I'll never forget um, just early in that year, they lost a ton to start that season – and the fact that they were able to rally and get all the way up to the four seed in a weird conference where 42 wins got you a four seed. Um, there were moments like he dunked on Christian Leitner. I was at a game in that first year, and it was one of the most um, athletic plays a Heat player I think has ever made. And uh, so there were just those moments, right, until the playoffs came. And then obviously the story goes as the story goes. But it was very early on, uh, I would say preseason even just that first game in philly you could see flashes speaking of flash well he wasn't that yet uh alex 
So it's definitely a, a different answer for me because I didn't start liking the sport of basketball until about 2005 kind of late 2005. So I was already, you know, it had already been a couple seasons deep into the weight experience. What I will say though, is he is the reason I fell in love with the sport, right? Like the, just watching him play somebody who can be that athletic and that agile, um, that explosive. And also with just that amount of skill, it was just a joy to watch, uh, you know, and, and it, it, he was, you know, he was a, an extremely influ influential just person as, as far as like, you know, me growing up just because I tuned into every game because of him. And, you know, that's, I guess that kind of speaks for itself in that way. And, you know, um, I, the, the, like the first season that I fully started to watch every game for the heat is when they won the championship. So it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, I've had a nice little experience here. Right. But, um, you know, D Wade is Man the reason why jumper. I got into it. That's what, it, that's what I was a sports guy. I wasn't a sports guy as a I, kid, and then I, I played NBA Street. You know, shout out to those that have played it. And NBA Street, like I'm like, oh, basketball is awesome. I'm gonna start following the NBA. And then it's like, oh wait, we have this like stud on our team who is just insane to watch every night. And and then I see like what happened happened, and he won a championship at 24, which like not many superstars have done. So you know, just getting to watch that, you know, right from the beginning. Um, you know, it was just awesome. Well, I, when I was writing, I think I wrote more words about Dwayne Wade than anybody else. Um, in fact, I don't even think it was close. Uh, <laughs> um, although, although Bleach Report got me to write a lot about LeBron, but um, I, I, I would say from the beginning, um, you know, there's very, uh, for me, there's there's three athletes I've covered from the beginning of their Hall of Fame careers till the end. Uh, Dwayne, Jason Taylor, and Zach Thomas. Um, and uh, that's a cool with list. Dwayne, though. Yeah, and they're all great guys. Obviously. And and I, uh, well, him too. Yeah. No, and I will say I'm proud that I have really good relationships with all three. Um, uh, and and there, I I appreciate all three of them in different ways. And and I I I can't believe I didn't go to any of their three Hall of Fame ceremonies for various conflicts and other reasons uh five more than five reasons but uh, i regret that i i'll say that uh with Dwayne, a couple things here uh the first thing was at the opening press conference uh you know i have a column that i, I cannot find because any anything i was right about got scratched from the web uh but i actually i, I loved the pick from the very beginning um and i i wrote it was and, and the fans love the pick i was at the arena and the fans love the pick, and I think it was because they recognized the name. It was, and they couldn't spell it, but uh, but they recognized the name because um, basically, uh, you know, there were a lot of foreign guys that were starting to get drafted then, and it was like so they were getting mixed in with these college players that that they'd uh, that they'd seen. So um, you know th that that was the first thing was kind of I, I titled it the innocent beginning. Um, that's what that's what Pat titled it that day. And I remember, uh, Dwayne was very modest and, um, soft-spoken. Didn't really have a lot to say. Obviously his personal life changed over time, uh, in quite a few ways from that opening press conference, but, uh, son in his you know, lap, his son was in his lap. Zaire was in his lap. And I, I can, I can remember. And, and he was talking about a shoe collection. I do remember that. Uh, but, but where I kind of got it was summer league. Um, he faced LeBron's team. They, they had, um, we, I was in Orlando and, and, you know, and Dwayne put on a show in that game. There were glimpses and everybody was there to watch Braun, but there were glimpses of Dwayne <laughs> in that game. Um, I was also in Philadelphia for that game that you mentioned, Greg, where he went up against Iverson, which is a game he talked about in his hall of fame speech. Um, but I, I, I think that, that the, the real, the real moment for me actually came a little bit later. Um, and people are going to talk about the New Orleans series and uh, and all that and and the shot in the lane and and I, I I have a particular affinity for that one because I'm sitting there looking goofy in my glasses right behind the baseline uh, as he makes the shot. But um, th there was there was another moment in that series that, that that struck me, which was Dwayne struggled some in that series. People don't remember like that first playoff series. He had three awful shooting games. Um, but he all, he bounced back after every one, and and that to me was 
kind of the sign of resilience with him that lasted throughout his career and ended up becoming a commercial, right? Fall down seven, get up eight. Um, and, and you kind of saw it in that series. And it wasn't just the runner in the lane. There was a huge three he made in that series also. And that's why it stuck out so much when our good friend Stan Van Gundy took him off the floor in that last game against Indiana, a series in which he announced himself more publicly with the dunk over Jermaine. Um, but he took him off the floor for Rafer Alston because Rafer had a better chance to make a three there. But I think that was the last time Dwayne Wade was ever taken off the floor at the end of the game. So I, to me, it was more that New Orleans series that it was like, okay, because the other thing people don't remember about Dwayne's rookie season was it was choppy. There, there were, there were times in there where there were a lot of turnovers. He was playing a position he wasn't supposed to play before, but I'm going to cycle back to that original column. Cause I always throw this in because Dan Lebitard's beaten me at everything in life. But that particular day, because Dan, and that's why I, I'm so pissed that I can't find this column online when I literally saw it there three months ago. Damn you, Sun Sentinel. Um, Dan didn't like the pick. And and because he said they had Eddie Jones. And, and that's why as we pivot ahead to this draft, you do not pass on a premium talent or a generational talent because he plays the same position as the guy you have. You figure it out. And they figured it out. They played Dwayne at point for the first year, moved Eddie, uh, kept Eddie at the two, and then moved Eddie to the three the next year. And and that's the that was the direction that they went. So a lot of moments there. I mean, this is one of the easier ones for us to encapsulate. The franchise would be entirely different. I mean, there's just no way. If they take Kurt Heinrich there, like Shaq's never there. There's no championship in 2006. Uh None of it, like none of that happens, right? Braun's never here. Like none of it. Like I mean, Kirk Heinrich, no Jimmy, scrappy, Kirk, right? No Jimmy, Kirk Heinrich, scrappy player. <laughs> well, maybe Jimmy would have been here because, well, no, he wouldn't have because Kirk Heinrich would have been there. Dwayne would have been in Chicago, maybe. It wouldn't have been good. It wouldn't have been good. I mean, I who knows? But this is just one of those. Like we're gonna get, and these other draft episodes are gonna be like, all right, well, maybe they could have looked at this guy, could have looked at that guy. Th there was no room for regret here other than they needed more you know, size. Well, they and they didn't hit on their That's second why... round pick Jerome Beasley. Don't forget. No, they did not. <laughs> Nor did they hit on their, their 2008 pick Michael Beasley, which is going to be another That's episode great. that we get to. I, I say Alex, one more you, thing you really wanted... quick. Yes, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, I, I just wanted to say like, you know, just hearing you talk about it, like it, it really is telling you know, those circumstances with that draft because it's kind of informed the way that they've handled the draft ever since as far as, mm -hmm. like, taking the best player available over positional fit. Um, another thing, like, you talked about Dwayne playing point guard even though they knew he was a two guard and even though Eddie Jones was there in that spot already as a, you know, kind of a solidified player. the That's something that they've kind of done with their other draft picks where it's like they kind of mm -hmm. put them in, you know, take them out of their comfort zone you know, for guys that are higher up, you know, mm -hmm. like foundational pieces and be like, okay, we're going to try to get you to learn some of these skills. You might not be elite at them, but you're going to learn them, get these while playing these reps kind of out of position, or if it's in a kind of a different role, maybe more handling than you expected to. And I think like they've done that obviously to lesser extents, but throughout the years with, I don't know, like Tyler, Josh, um, mm -hmm. not really Bam because he was just kind of a, he was, he was pigeonholed into that backup five role, but as bam you know became a starter they've constantly added more and more to his plate so even there like you could find plenty of examples throughout the years justice right when he was you know they finally gave him like point guard duties that that you know a, a lot of those same kind of um you know that line of thinking has been applied right and you're seeing it now with Jovic and Hakas to different extents the other thing is like you mentioned at the top I mean, that they should have lost that game no they shouldn't have and i think that's <laughs> really informed what they've done since maybe to a fault some might argue i don't really feel that way yeah. but i i you know it's i guess whether you're not like you take like the part of the game God or basketball yeah, like the idea seriously because it's like they they didn't lose that game they they play to win and then they end up with a better player anyway the guy that they should have you know quote unquote lost the game for and ends up <laughs> and they got chris Bosch anyway anyway yeah. and they got lebron too and they got lebron too so like, I, I know so there was no reason to tank but, the number one pick that's there's no way that yeah. hasn't like influenced some of their decisions ever since as far as like whether or not like you lose the last game of the season for better draft position. 
No, it's fair. We, I mean, they talk about the karma in the game a lot, uh, but they did end up with, with three. Uh, there's a great trivia question, too. Look it up sometime because we talk about the 2003 draft. We're not going to get as much of the 1992 draft because actually uh, the Heat picked a player, but it's not the one that everybody remembers playing for the Heat. But the Heat had basically like the like the whole top 10 ended up playing for the Heat at one point or another, like Leitner, uh, you know, obviously Shaq plus and Zoe. Uh, guys that they did not draft, they all ended up playing. Even and I think Todd Day, even though I don't know, he actually played a game for Miami because Pat told him to go home. But but yeah, so th- but this particular draft, uh, they end up with one, uh, four, and five uh, playing together. Uh, although those are not the numbers that they wore with the Heat. Of course, they wore uh, one, three, and six in in uh, uh, differently. But um, again, the 2003 draft is the draft that made this franchise what it became. Honestly. Um, and, uh, and, and there's just, there's, you know, it's just one of those things. Sometimes you just pull the right lever. I mean, that that's it. And then, you know, you have to develop the player, which they did. Uh, I think Alex, you got into that a little bit about him developing more as a point guard and all the rest. And then, uh, and then you have to capitalize. And I think that's where some current heat fans are frustrated. Uh, but they forget that in 2008, 2009, which was arguably the best of Dwayne, uh, the Heat didn't really supplement. They they waited uh, to 2010. Are they waiting to supplement Jimmy Butler? We'll see what happens with that. All right, thanks to Greg. Thanks to Alex. Alex, 2008, you're going to enjoy that one. Have a good one, everybody.